Chapter One of She. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. She by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter One. My Visitor. There are some events of which each circumstance and surrounding detail seems to be graven on the memory in such a fashion that we cannot forget it. And so it is with the scene that I am about to describe. It rises as clearly before my mind at this moment as though it had happened but yesterday. It was in this very month something over twenty years ago that I, Ludwig Horace Holly, was sitting one night in my rooms at Cambridge, grinding away at some mathematical work, I forget what. I was to go up for my fellowship within a week, and was expected by my tutor and my college generally to distinguish myself. At last, wearied out, I flung my book down, and, going to the mantelpiece, took down a pipe and filled it. There was a candle burning on the mantelpiece, and a long, narrow glass at the back of it, and as I was in the act of lighting the pipe, I caught sight of my own countenance in the glass, and paused to reflect. The lighted match burnt away till it scorched my fingers, forcing me to drop it. But still I stood and stared at myself in the glass, and reflected. Well, I said aloud at last, it is to be hoped that I shall be able to do something with the inside of my head, for I shall certainly never be anything by the help of the outside. This remark will doubtless strike anybody who reads it as being slightly obscure, but I was in reality alluding to my physical deficiencies. Most men of twenty-two are endowed, at any rate, with some share of the comeliness of youth, but to me even this was denied. Short, thick-set, and deep-chested, almost to deformity, with long, sinewy arms, heavy features, deep-set grey eyes, a low brow half overgrown with a mop of thick black hair, like a deserted clearing on which the forest had once more begun to encroach. Such was my appearance nearly a quarter of a century ago, and such, with some modification, it is to this day. Like Cain, I was branded, branded by nature with the stamp of abnormal ugliness, as I was gifted by nature with iron and abnormal strength, and considerable intellectual powers. So ugly was I that the spruce young men of my college, though they were proud enough of my feats of endurance and physical prowess, did not even care to be seen walking with me. Was it wonderful that I was misanthropic and sullen? Was it wonderful that I brooded and worked alone and had no friends, at least only one? I was set apart by nature to live alone, and drew comfort from her breast and hers only. Women hated the sight of me. Only a week before I had heard one call me a monster, when she thought I was out of hearing, and say that I had converted her to the monkey theory. Once, indeed, a woman pretended to care for me, and I lavished all the pent-up affection of my nature upon her. Then money that was to have come to me went elsewhere, and she discarded me. I pleaded with her as I have never pleaded with any living creature before or since, for I was caught by her sweet face and loved her and in the end, by way of answer, she took me to the glass, and stood side by side with me, and looked into it. "'Now,' she said, "'if I am beauty, who are you?' That was when I was only twenty. And as I stood and stared, and felt a sort of grim satisfaction in the sense of my own loneliness, for I had neither father, nor mother, nor brother, and as I did so, there came a knock at my door, I listened before I went to open it, for it was nearly twelve o'clock at night, and I was in no mood to admit any stranger. I had but one friend in the college, or indeed in the world, perhaps it was he. Just then the person outside the door coughed, and I hastened to open it, for I knew the cough. A tall man of about thirty, with the remains of great personal beauty, came hurrying in, staggering beneath the weight of a massive iron box which he carried by handle with his right hand. He placed the box upon the table, and then fell into an awful fit of coughing. 
He coughed and coughed till his face became quite purple, and at last he sunk into a chair and began to spit up blood. I poured out some whiskey into a tumbler and gave it to him. He drank it and seemed better, though his better was very bad indeed. "'Why did you keep me standing there in the cold?' he asked pettishly. "'You know the draughts are deaf to me.' "'I did not know who it was,' I answered. "'You are a late visitor.' "'Yes, and I verily believe it to be my last visit,' he answered, with a ghastly attempt to smile. "'I am done for, Holly, I am done for. I do not believe that I shall see to-morrow.' "'Nonsense,' I said. "'Let me go for a doctor.' He waved me back imperiously with his hand. "'It is sober sense, but I want no doctors. I have studied medicine, and I know all about it. No doctors can help me. My last hour has come. For a year past I have lived only by a miracle. Now, listen to me as you have never listened to anybody before, for you will not have the opportunity of getting me to repeat my words. We have been friends for two years. Now, tell me, how much do you know about me? I know that you are rich, and have a fancy to come to college long after the age that most men leave it. I know that you have been married, and that your wife died and that you have been the best, indeed almost the only friend I ever had. Did you know that I have a son? No. I have. He is five years old. He cost me his mother's life, and I have never been able to bear to look upon his face in consequence. Holly, if you will accept the trust, I am going to leave you the boy's sole guardian. I sprang almost out of my chair. Me? I said. Yes, you. I have not studied you for two years for nothing. I have known for some time that I could not last, and since I realized the fact, I have been searching for someone to whom I could confide the boy and this. And he tapped the iron box. You are the man, Holly, for, like a rugged tree, you are hard and sound at core. Listen, the boy will be the only representative of one of the most ancient families in the world, that is, so far as families can be traced. You will laugh at me when I say it, but one day it will be proved to you beyond a doubt that my sixty-fifth or sixty-sixth lineal ancestor was an Egyptian priest of Isis, though he was himself of Grecian extraction, and was called Callicrates, open bracket, the strong and beautiful, or, more accurately, the beautiful in strength, close bracket. His father was one of the Greek mercenaries raised by Hakhor, a Mendesian pharaoh of the twenty-ninth dynasty, and his grandfather, or great-grandfather, I believe, was that very Callicrates, mentioned by Herodotus, in or about the year 339 before Christ, just at the time of the final fall of the pharaohs. This Callicrates, the priest, broke his vows of celibacy, and fled from Egypt with a princess of royal blood, who had fallen in love with him, and was finally wrecked upon the coast of Africa, somewhere, as I believe, in the neighbourhood of where Delagoa Bay now is, or rather to the north of it, he and his wife being saved, and all the remainder of their company destroyed in one way or another. Here they endured great hardships, but were at length entertained by the mighty queen of a savage people, a white woman of peculiar loveliness, who, under circumstances which I cannot enter into, but which you will one day learn, if you live, from the contents of the box, finally murdered my ancestor Callicrates. His wife, however, escaped, how I know not, to Athens, bearing a child with her, whom she named his Thysines, or the mighty Avenger. Five hundred years or more afterwards, the family migrated to Rome, under circumstances of which no trace remains, and here, probably with the idea of preserving the idea of vengeance, where we find set out in the name of Tisisthenes, they appear to have pretty regularly assumed the cognomen of Vindex, or Avenger. Here, too, they remained for another five centuries or more, till about 770 A.D., when Charlemagne invaded Lombardy, where they were then settled. Whereon the head of the family seems to have attached himself to the great emperor, and to have returned with him across the Alps, and finally to have settled in Brittany. 
Eight generations later his lineal representative crossed to England in the reign of Edward the Confessor, and in the time of William the Conqueror was advanced to great honour and power. From that time to the present day I can trace my descent without a break. Not that the Vincies, for that was the final corruption of the name after its bearers took root in English soil, have been particularly distinguished, they never came much to the fore. Sometimes they were soldiers, sometimes merchants, but on the whole they have preserved a dead level of respectability, and still a deader level of mediocrity. From the time of Charles the Second till the beginning of the present century they were merchants. About 1790, my grandfather made a considerable fortune out of brewing, and retired. In 1821 he died, and my father succeeded him, and dissipated most of the money. Ten years ago he died also, leaving me a net income of about two thousand a year. Then it was that I undertook an expedition in connection with that. And he pointed to the iron chest, which ended disastrously enough. On my way back I travelled in the south of Europe, and finally reached Athens. There I met my beloved wife, who might well also have been called beautiful, like my old Greek ancestor. There I married her, and there, a year afterwards, when my boy was born, she died. He paused a while, his head sunk upon his hand, and then continued. My marriage had diverted me from a project which I cannot enter into now. I have no time, Holly, I have no time. One day, if you accept my trust, you will learn about it. After my wife's death, I turned my mind to it again. But first it was necessary, or at least I concede that it was necessary, that I should attain to perfect knowledge of Eastern dialects, especially Arabic. It was to facilitate my studies that I came here. Very soon, however, my disease developed itself, and now there is an end of me. And as though to emphasize his words, he burst into another terrible fit of coughing. I gave him some more whiskey, and after resting he went on. I have never seen my boy, Leo, since he was a tiny baby. I never could bear to see him, but they tell me that he is a quick and handsome child. In this envelope, and he produced a letter from his pocket addressed to myself, I have jotted down the course I wish followed in the boy's education. It is a somewhat peculiar one. At any rate, I could not entrust it to a stranger. Once more, will you undertake it? I must first know what I am to undertake, I answered. You are to undertake to have the boy, Leo, to live with you till he is twenty-five years of age. Not to send him to school, remember. On his twenty-fifth birthday your guardianship will end, and you will then, with the keys that I give you now, and he placed them on the table, open the iron box, and let him see and read the contents, and say whether or not he is willing to undertake the quest. There is no obligation on him to do so. Now, as regards terms, my present income is two thousand two hundred a year. Half of that income I have secured to you by will for life, contingently on your undertaking the guardianship. That is, one thousand a year, remuneration, to yourself, for you will have to give up your life to it, and one hundred a year to pay for the board of the boy. The rest is to accumulate till Leo is twenty-five, so that there may be a sum in hand should he wish to undertake the quest of which I spoke. And suppose I were to die? I asked. Then the boy must become a ward of chancery and take his chance. Only be careful that the iron chest is passed on to him by your will. Listen, Holly, don't refuse me. Believe me, this is to your advantage. You are not fit to mix with the world. It would only embitter you. In a few weeks you will become a fellow of your college, and the income that you will derive from that, combined with what I have left you, will enable you to live a life of learned leisure, alternated with the sport of which you are so fond, such as will exactly suit you. He paused and looked at me anxiously, but I still hesitated. The charge seemed so very strange. For my sake, Holly, we have been good friends, and I have no time to make other arrangements. "'Very well,' I said. "'I will do it, provided there is nothing in this paper to make me change my mind.' 
and I touched the envelope he had put upon the table by the keys. "'Thank you, Holly, thank you. There is nothing at all. Swear to me by God that you will be a father to the boy, and follow my directions to the letter?' "'I swear it,' I answered solemnly. "'Very well. Remember that perhaps one day I shall ask for the account of your oath, for though I am dead and forgotten, yet I shall live. There is no such thing as death, Holly, only a change. And, as you may perhaps learn in time to come, I believe that even that change could under certain circumstances be indefinitely postponed. And again he broke into one of his dreadful fits of coughing. There, he said, I must go. You have the chest, and my will will be found among my papers, under the authority of which the child will be handed over to you. You will be well paid, Holly, and I know that you are honest. But if you betray my trust, by heaven I will haunt you. I said nothing, being indeed too bewildered to speak. He held up the candle and looked at his own face in the glass. It had been a beautiful face, but disease had wrecked it. Food for the worms, he said. Curious to think that in a few hours I shall be stiff and cold. The journey done, the little game played out. Ah, me, Holly, life is not worth the trouble of life, except when one is in love. At least, mine has not been. But the boy Leo's may be if he has the courage and the faith. Good-bye, my friend. And with a sudden act of tenderness, he flung his arm about me and kissed me on the forehead, and then turned to go. Look here, Vincy, I said. If you are as ill as you think, you had better let me fetch a doctor. No, no, he said earnestly. Promise me that you won't. I am going to die. "'and like a poisoned rat I wish to die alone. "'I don't believe you're going to do anything of the sort,' I answered. "'He smiled, and with the word, remember, on his lips, was gone. "'As for myself, I sat down and rubbed my eyes, "'wondering if I'd been asleep. "'As this supposition would not bear investigation, "'I gave it up, and began to think that Vincy must have been drinking.' I knew that he was, and had been, very ill. But still it seemed impossible that he could be in such a condition, as to be able to know for certain that he would not outlive the night. Had he been so near dissolution, surely he would have scarcely been able to walk, and carry a heavy iron box with him. The whole story on reflection seemed to me utterly incredible, for I was not then old enough to be aware how many things happen in this world that the common sense of the average man would set down as so improbable as to be absolutely impossible. This is a fact which I have only recently mastered. Was it likely that a man would have a son five years of age, whom he had never seen since he was a tiny infant? No. Was it likely that he could foretell his own death so accurately? No. Was it likely that he could trace his pedigree for more than three centuries before Christ? or that he would suddenly confide the absolute guardianship of his child, and leave half his fortune to a college friend? Most certainly not. Clearly Vincy was either drunk or mad. That being so, what did it mean, and what was in the sealed iron chest? The whole thing baffled and puzzled me to such an extent that at last I could stand it no longer, and determined to sleep over it. So I jumped up, and having put the keys and the letter that Vincy had left away into my dispatch box, and stowed the iron chest in a large portmanteau, I turned in and was soon fast asleep. As it seemed to me, I had only been asleep for a few minutes, when I was awakened by somebody calling me. I sat up and rubbed my eyes. It was broad daylight. Eight o'clock, in fact. "'Why, what is the matter with you, John?' I asked on the jip who waited on Vincy and myself. You look as though you had seen a ghost. Yes, sir, and so I have, he answered. Leastways, I've seen a corpse, which is worse. I've been in to call Mr. Vincy, as usual, and there he lies, stark and dead. End of chapter 1